Hello wonderful person and welcome to What The Math, this is Anton and today we're going to be doing some math in space. We're going to talk about a concept of Kepler's third law and I'm going to show you a few calculations that scientists usually use to basically estimate very accurately a mass of a certain object. So for example, if we discover a new object in space and we want to know its mass, all we need to do is find a satellite orbiting around it. So for example, if one day we actually discover a new object like when we discovered Saturn and we discovered that it had a very large satellite called Titan orbiting around it, we were able to estimate the mass of Saturn pretty accurately. Today I'm going to explain to you how it's done and why it's so important. Welcome to What The Math and enjoy the video. <laughs> And let's actually start by talking about these Kepler's laws. So uh, Kepler was a person who lived hundreds of years ago, and he actually uh, was able to, without knowing anything about astronomy at first, uh, to kind of come up with these really cool laws. The first one was about ellipses. He described that um, all of the planetary bodies, all of the things in space usually follow ellipse. Uh, or an elliptical shape, he actually explained what, what it means and how they work. He also had a second law where he actually proved that uh, in, a, in an ellipse, in an equal time, an object is going to create equal areas, and so this was called the uh, law of areas. But it's the third law that we're going to talk about in detail, because that's the law that kind of makes it a little bit more interesting. And there's a website that I'm going to be posting in the description that is basically talking about this law, also known as Law of Harmonies. And the idea here is that if you were to look at the uh, relationship between a period of, uh, or basically an orbit of a planet, and the distance to the sun, there is actually a very interesting relationship. And I'm going to show you to you using this picture right here. And in this particular picture, or I guess a graph, uh, on the bottom here we have the orbital period, which is of course the time it takes for a planet, for an object to orbit the sun, but it's actually squared. So if, for example, if the orbital period is two years, then if we square it, we get four. If the orbital period is seven years, if we square it, we will get 49. And on the left side here, on the vertical axis, it is the distance to the sun, to the central object. But this time it's actually cubed. So same thing, if we have two cubed, it will give us eight. And if it's seven cubed, it will give us, oh boy, I need to do this uh, with a calculator, 343. And this was thanks to my calculator, horrible math teacher, I know. Anyway, so 343, eight is uh, what we'll have on the vertical side here. Now, if you were to actually place all of the single planets on the bottom and square their uh, orbital period, and then if you were to place the distance and cube it, you would get this perfectly straight line. There's a perfect relationship between all of the planets, um, their distance and their orbital uh, period. And if you were to basically calculate the, you know, the square of the orbital period divided by the radius um, or their orbital radius cubed, you would get this almost exact value of almost exactly one. So what this means is that if one day we find an object somewhere right here, let's just call, call this object planet nine. And if we actually know how far away it is, we can then estimate how uh, one um, one year on this planet will be and vice versa. If we actually find out how long the year is, we can find out how far away this planet is by essentially just using this particular third law of Kepler. And then on top of this, there was another person by the name of Newton, which I'm sure you have heard of before. And Newton came up with something called gravitational constant, also known as G. And G is a really interesting number. If you type gravitational constant in Google, you'll get the actual value. It's 6.67408 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 11. So it's a very, very, very small number. It's kind of like saying 0 0.0000067. Um, meters cubed divided by kilogram divided by a second square. Now this is a constant and just like pi it never changes anywhere in the universe. It's essentially a number that is always the same and that's why it's so important because using this and other laws of Newton with combination of uh, third law of Kepler we can now use this. And this is actually the picture I found on this website that you see here, which also allows you to calculate um, all of these values automatically without really using the formulas. But we're going to be using this right here. So essentially, you can express mass, period, or um, orbital radius 
using the combination of Kepler's law and Newtonian laws, where you can now calculate, like for example, if you have radius, if you have the radius of an orbit, and if you have, uh, if you know the time it takes for this orbit to complete, because g is constant and because pi is constant, you can now calculate the mass of a planet or an object. Same thing with the period. If you know the mass of the object and if you know its um, radius, orbital radius, you can calculate the time it takes it to orbit. And of course, the same with radius. If you know the mass, if you know the uh, time it takes it to orbit uh, something, you can then calculate the uh, orbital radius. Now, all of these formulas uh, were derived uh, hundreds of years ago, even before we went to space, which is why it's so brilliant. I mean, people back then were super, super smart, even though people today are pretty smart too, but I think uh, Newton and Kepler were absolutely genius. And so let's actually try to use this formula, this formula right here, to try to calculate the mass of an object in Universe Sandbox 2 using this hypothetical scenario of Planet 9. So let's just say that sometime in the future, year 2017, 2018, 2019, or possibly sometime later, we actually see Planet 9, and we also notice that it has a little moon orbiting around it. And for the lack of a better name, this moon is going to be known as Moon 9, because it's Planet 9, Moon 9, I should probably have typed this in letters, not uh, in numbers. So here we go, we've discovered Planet 9, we now see it with our telescopes, when we see the Moon 9 orbiting around it. Now, we don't know the mass of this planet though, but we see that there is a Moon orbiting around it every, um, I guess, what is this, every few hours? And I'm going to go right here and check out the orbital parameters for this Moon. So, first of all, we can see that the um, orbital radius in other words, the distance bet uh, between the center of the planet 9 and the moon is approximately 100,000 kilometers. It's 99,939, but it's basically almost 100,000. And we see that it, uh, one orbital period in days is 1.15, so it's uh, just over one day. We can convert this to seconds, because it has to be in seconds, and the value here is 99,330 seconds. So that's pretty interesting. So 99, um, almost 99,000 kilometers and 99,000 seconds. So let's write this down. So we have 99,000 seconds. It's going to be very approximate. And the radius here will be approximately 100 million meters because we need to convert kilometers into meters since the gravitational constant has a meters, kilograms, and seconds as its unit. So this has to be using the same unit. Now we're going to write down this number as well, which is 0 0.10067408 and the unit here was meters cubed uh, divided by kilograms divided by second square. Then we have pi, so both of these are constants, I'm gonna make them blue, and pi we're going to just take approximate value of 3.14, and so that's all we really need. We have two constants and two values that we calculate by measuring how long it takes uh, for this particular moon, moon 9 to orbit around planet 9, and uh, by finding the approximate radius uh, of these two objects by basically staring at it through our telescopes. And so now we're going to do some calculator work here. We're going to take 4 pi squared multiplied by a million cubed. This is a meter cubed, of course. And then divide all of this by this number g. I'm just going to write g so that I don't have to rewrite the number. And then uh, also divide this by... 99,000 squared, and this is second squared. And I've decided to just use the Google calculator here because it does uh, do a pretty good job with units as well. So it's 4 pi square multiplied by uh, 1 million meters cubed divided by g, which actually does automatically, uh, it calculates it automatically, and uh, divided by 99,000 seconds to the power of 2. The answer here that I got is 6.03, basically 6 times 10 to the power of 25. All right, so what does that mean? So that's uh, in kilograms. Uh, how many Earths would that be? And the beauty of Google Calculator is that it also allows you to type commands like divide by Earth mass. So I'm going to type Earth mass and look at that. It tells me this is approximately 10.1 Earths. All right, uh, is, that, is that correct? Let's find out. We're going to go to Planet 9 and the estimate here is 10 Earths. All right, excellent. And in terms of kilograms, it's about 5.97 uh, times 10 to the power of 25. So we were pretty close in our estimate, but there was a little bit of discrepancy, mostly because I did use um, approximate values for both seconds and the radius. And essentially, this is how scientists can easily find the mass of any object as soon as they find an, a moon orbiting around it. And this is really exciting for us because very recently, 
we have discovered that there is a moon of Maki Maki. It's a video I made very recently, I believe last week. And uh, Maki Maki has a moon that doesn't really have a name yet. It's just called MK2, which is, I guess, Maki Maki 2. Uh, it, it, its orbital period uh, is unknown, but its orbital radius is about 21,000 kilometers. Once we calculate how long it takes it to complete one orbit, we'll be able to very accurately find out how massive Maki Maki is, which is exciting because then using this information, we can estimate its density. We can find out what's on the inside by basically knowing the mass and knowing its size. So this is essentially how astronomers usually calculate masses of uh, distant objects and how accurate they can be by using the law of harmonies, which is essentially a super old law uh, that was discovered by Kepler and later improved by Newton and about which you can read in the link that I'm posting in the description below. Anyway, hopefully you enjoyed this video and hopefully you learned a little bit of mathematics on how astronomers usually find all of this stuff and how they actually know how massive th things are in space. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you still haven't. Share this video with people that like math, that like science, like space science, and want to learn through video games. I'll see you guys in the next video. And as always, game you later. Bye-bye. And in the meanwhile, I'm going to do this. Destruction. Awesome, beautiful destruction. And this is what Maki Maki would look like if you were to smack things into it in Universe Cinebox 2. See you guys later. Bye-bye.